Welcome and greetings, everyone. And uh, my name is John Horgan, and I am the Boshafter uh, all three weeks now. And uh, it's delightful to be here uh, to launch yet another iteration of uh, Transmediale here at Canada House. We have a great, great evening ahead of us, and I want to thank a bunch of people before we get started, starting with Nora Omerchi, my Irish compatriot over there, the artistic director, uh, and the one that brought us all together here today. And I also want to thank the, um, the staff uh, within the Public Affairs Bureau for making sure that this was the highlight of my week. And, uh, and I've got a whole bunch of really cool stuff happening later on, so that tells you what kind of week that I'm having. I want to say good evening to Corey Doctorow, who uh, uh, he and I have shared some stories about days gone by, and it's really good to see him. Thank you so much for coming and being uh, with us tonight, Frederica, uh, thank you so much as well, Carl to Carl Toyner, Carl Toyner, thank you, Frederica is here, as well as Helen Starr, uh, and she, uh, the three of them will be uh, joining for a consultation and a discussion in a few moments. I also want to say hello to Svetlana Matvienko, a last year's uh, speaker. Svetlana, can you give us a wave? Well done. <laughs> Uh, Nora on the spot, but she said that your presentation last year was the best presentation she's ever heard. Corey, no pressure, <laughs> but uh, the way we go. And uh, to the fans of Marshall McLuhan, I, uh, I was an undergrad while Marshall McLuhan was still alive, and uh, that's some 45 years ago. But the impact that uh, this seminal thinker has had on how we view technology, how we view media, cool and hot media, the message, the media is the, the medium is the message. These are, are ideas and perspectives that still endure to this day, even though the internet as we understand it had not been contemplated in the minds of, of the developers who have made it what it is today. And I'm hopeful that Corey will be able to give us some directions on where we go and how we recapture the importance and the value of being able to communicate so fast in so many ways uh, using our own intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. But I'm demonstrating a bias there, and I'm hopeful that that will come up in the conversation as we go ahead. But this year's uh, lecture is uh, coming up starting in 2008. The uh, Canadian Embassy has partnered with uh, the festival to ensure that we take advantage of this lovely facility and also to highlight Canadians, Canadian thought, and how we can take advantage of the opportunities of bringing people together. The diversity in the room, the diversity on the planet, can be bridged by the technologies that we have available to us today. So here in the Canada room, uh, we'll be viewing uh, uh, the, the presentations. Uh, Corey will be uh, giving the, 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 the lecture about his, uh, his expectations, his views, his perspectives. Of course, he's an extraordinary communicator. His books... Uh, uh, and his, uh, his co-edited blog, Boing Boing, uh, I have not yet uh, tuned in, but Corey, I can assure you that I will be doing that as the evening goes on. Uh, not in the middle, but at the evening, it, it comes to an end. Uh, but these are, these are topical subjects that we're going to be discussing uh, this evening, and you're going to be uh, provoked. And that provocation will lead to more thought and more critical inquiry. And that was the essence of who McLuhan was. Uh, those that came before him, like Harold Ennis, who I said I would get into this at some point today, and Northrop Fry, again, a, 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 an extraordinary Canadian writer. All of them found themselves in the University of Toronto in the mid-60s, assessing and looking at the future at a time when the future was quite uncertain, not unlike today. So having the opportunity at this festival to kick off with a discussion led by Canadian talking about technologies and talking from a perspective that was initiated by a Canadian, Marsha McLuhan, is truly uh, an honor for us here today. I want to also let you know that it's not just tonight that you'll be able to have access to Canadian content. Uh, there are a number of other programs that you can come in contact with, not here, but at other parts of, of the festival. And I have them on these pages that I've been ignoring diligently, and I cannot find them, so I will... Keep moving them around. Anybody uh, talk amongst yourselves? I'll only be a minute. I can't find them. But there are other Canadians involved. And, uh, <laughs> and 
And that, that's worth us in itself. And rather than stay here and keep moving these pages around, I'm going to invite uh, Lee Sanchuk uh, Hunchuk up to uh, talk about the program and see where we go from here. But thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the evening. Enjoy the proceedings. Be provoked. Make a critical inquiry tomorrow. Is there a result of something you hear tonight? Thanks very much. all for joining us. Um, I'm Elise. I'm one of the curators of the festival um, that you'll be hopefully um, attending over the next uh, few days along with um, Yasmin in the front row. In many ways. Um, so we're very happy to be here this evening uh, at the Embassy of Canada for this year's Marshall McLuhan Lecture. Uh, as mentioned already, since 2008, this lecture has been a focus of cooperation between Transmediae and the Embassy of Canada here in Berlin. Each year, uh, we select a Canadian cultural figure whose work broadens Marshall McLuhan's ideas of media and technology. Um, before introducing this year's speakers and respondents, um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Embassy of Canada and the entire team um, for hosting us tonight and for their support of our ongoing partnership. For this year's lecture, uh, as you've heard by now, we have invited um, Herr Professor Dr. 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 O, uh, an internationally renowned author and journalist whose works and writings have long been critical of the informational capitalist model of the internet, its economic model that exacerbates power inequalities and undermines basic freedoms. In his talk tonight, Corey will talk through his term in shittification or platform decay a seemingly inevitable consequence and pattern that arises from the combination of how a platform allocates value and its very nature as a two-sided market. At a time when a fundamental reimagining of the logic by which we organize information and network people is more urgent than ever, his lecture tonight reminds us that an alternative internet and its realization will come with challenges and will require the articulation of a varied set of grievances under a common cause. It will require the nurturing of a sense of solidarity among multiple yet distinct collectives. His respondent tonight is Federica Caltuena, whose work has focused on the intersection of emerging technology, ethics, and rights. She was previously Director for Technology and Human Rights at Human Rights Watch, Special Advisor for the Vice President of the European Commission, as well as the inaugural Director of the European AI Fund, a philanthropic initiative to strengthen civil society in Europe. In her conversation with Corey, she will draw out key aspects of his lecture that unpack the processes by which the internet has been consolidated under the control of a small set of corporations. Their conversation tonight is moderated by Helen Starr, an Afro-Carib Trinidadian world building commissioner, fantastic description, whose practice focuses on the protocols of Indigenous AI. We look forward to hearing all three in conversation together, and please join me in welcoming Corey, Frederica, and Helen to Transmedia. Mr. Ambassador, hello and good evening. I have to say, hearing Herr Professor Dr. Dr. Rowe, that was my dream come true. I actually went to Innes College at the University of Toronto and dropped out. I went to the University of Waterloo, where I studied under uh, Harold Innes' daughter uh, and Innes Dack and dropped out. I also dropped out of York University and uh, Michigan State. I never got an undergraduate degree, but now I hold two doctorates. And the only reason I wanted them is someone once told me that once you have two doctorates, the Germans will call you Dr. Doctor. So here we are, <laughs> three hundred. So last year, I coined this term in shittification to describe the way that platforms decay, and my obscene little word is doing big numbers. The American Dialectic Society made it the word of the year, which I presume means that I am now destined to have a poop emoji on my tombstone. So what is in shittification, and why did it catch fire? In shittification is my theory explaining how the internet was colonized by platforms, and why all those platforms are all degrading so quickly and so thoroughly right now, and why that matters, and what we can do about it. 
So we are living through an era we can call the Enshittacene, a great enshittening in which all the services that matter to us, that we rely on, are giant, turning into giant piles of shit all at once. This is frustrating, it's demoralizing, it's even terrifying, and I think the mind shittification framework goes a long way to explaining it. It moves us out of the realm of quasi-mystic notions of the great forces of history and into a material world of specific decisions made by named people, decisions that we can reverse, made by people whose addresses and pitchfork sizes we can discover. And shitification names the problem and proposes a solution. It's not just a way of saying things are getting worse. So, of course, it's fine with me if that's how you want to use it. It's an English word, and in English we don't have the word for English Rechtschreibung. English is a free-for-all. Our words mean whatever you want them to mean. So go nuts, mein Kerle. So in case you want to use enshittification in a more precise and technical way, I'm going to examine tonight how enshittification works. This is a three-stage process. First, platforms are good to their users. Then they abuse their users to allocate value to their business customers. Finally, they abuse those business customers to reallocate value to themselves, and then they die. So let's do a case study, and there is no better case study for enshittification than Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a company that was literally founded to non-consensually rate the fuckability of Harvard undergraduates, and it got worse after that. <laughs> when Facebook started, it was only open to US college kids. You needed a .edu address. But in 2006, all that changed. They opened up to the general public. And it told all of those users out there hey, I know you're using MySpace, but MySpace is owned by Rupert Murdoch. And he's an evil, crapulent, senescent Australian billionaire who spies you on you with every hour that God sends. Come to Facebook. We're the service that will never spy on you. All you need to do is tell us who matters to you in this world, and we will compose a dynamic, real-time feed of everything those people post for the people who follow them uh, and that they want them to see. That was stage one. Facebook had this surplus, this cash from its investors, and it allocated the surplus to those end users. The end users then locked themselves into Facebook. Facebook, like most tech businesses, enjoys something that economists call network effects. Products and services enjoy network effects if they get better when more people use them. So you join Facebook because there were some people there that you wanted to talk to, and then they joined Facebook because they wanted to talk to you. But Facebook didn't just have great network effects. It had massive switching costs. Switching costs, another economist term, is everything you have to give up when you change products or services. And in Facebook's case, the switching costs were all the friends that followed you onto Facebook and that you followed onto Facebook. Now, in theory, all of you could have just decided to leave Facebook together and go somewhere else. But in practice, you were hamstrung by another economist term, the collective action problem. It's hard to get a lot of people to do the same thing at the same time. If you came here with half a dozen friends and you go out for drinks when it's over, you're going to argue for a long time about where to go for drinks. You have no hope of getting 200 Facebook friends to all leave Facebook, let alone agree on where you're going to go. So Facebook users engaged in this form of mutual hostage taking that kept them glued to the platform. And Facebook understood and exploited that hostage situation and began to withdraw surplus from its end users and allocate it to two different groups of business customers, advertisers and publishers. So to the advertisers, Facebook said, do you remember when we told these credulous losers that we weren't going to spy on them? That was a lie. We are spying on them from asshole to appetite, and for very small amounts of money, we will sell you access to that surveillance data. Just tell us who you want to show an ad to, and we will show the ad to that person, we have an entire building full of engineers who are going to do nothing but fight ad fraud. Every dollar you spend is going to buy you an ad that's going to be seen by the person you intended to see it. Then Facebook turned to the publishers and it said, hey, do you remember when we told these hayseeds that we were only going to show them the things that they asked to see? That was also a lie. All you need to do is upload excerpts of the content from your website to Facebook with a link back to your website and we will non-consensually cram that into the eyeballs of people who never asked to see it. We will give you a free traffic funnel of people who will come to your website that you can monetize as you see fit. And so the users will become stuck to your feed, 
and they'll become your subscribers, and they'll see everything you post after that. And so advertisers and publishers, they got stuck to the platform too, held hostage by the users who are holding each other hostage. And everyone was locked in. And that was the signal for Facebook to start withdrawing that surplus and handing it over to its uh, own shareholders. So for the users, this meant that the experience of being on Facebook changed. The stuff in your feed was no longer the things that you'd asked to see. That was dialed down to a homeopathic dose, which left behind an enormous amount of space that Facebook could fill up with paid for boost content and advertisements. For the advertisers, it meant that the prices went up even as enforcement of, uh, against ad fraud went down. So advertisers paid much more to reach fewer people and the people that they reached were, worst, uh, were not targeted as, as finely and as uh, accurately. For publishers, Facebook took its algorithmic feed and it turned down the likelihood that its content would be suggested or shown to its subscribers unless they put more and more of each article in the feed. Until finally, they were posting full texts to Facebook, the whole article, turning them into a commodity backend supplier to Facebook. And then for the coup de grace, Facebook said, when you put a link back to your website in your feed, we don't know if it's a malicious link. And so if you want your stuff to reach the people who asked to see it, you can't link back to your own website. You are trapped here monetizing your work through our increasingly crooked and corrupted advertising marketplace. When those groups squat, the publishers, the advertisers, Facebook executives repeated the lesson that they had perfected when they all took the Darth Vader MBA. That lesson is, I have altered the deal. Pray I don't alter it further. Facebook now enters the most dangerous phase of shitification, the point at which it has drawn out all of the available surplus, leaving behind just enough residue that everyone stays locked to the platform. Business customers stuck to end users, end users stuck to each other. Um, but that is a very, very brittle equilibrium because the difference between, God, I hate this place, but I can't seem to stop logging into it, and what the hell am I still doing here? I'm bolting for the exits, is razor thin. It just takes one Cambridge Analytica scandal, one whistleblower, one live stream mass shooting, and people bolt for the exit. And then Facebook discovers that network effects are a two-edged sword. Because if you can't leave because everyone else is staying, then once everyone else starts to leave, there's no reason for you not to go too. And that is terminal and shitification, the phase where the platform becomes a giant pile of shit. And that phase triggers something that you and I would call panic, but in Silicon Valley, they have a technical term for it. They call it pivoting. <laughs> and Facebook's pivot was, we've changed our mind. The future isn't arguing with your racist uncle in a text forum. It's me converting all of you to legless, sexless, heavily surveilled, low polygon cartoon characters in a virtual world called the metaverse that we stole from a 25-year-old cyberpunk novel. Now, that is the process of enchitification. If enchitification were a disease, we'd call it the disease's natural history. But it doesn't tell you how the enshitification works, nor does it tell you why everything is enshitifying right now. And without those details, we can't know what to do about enshitification. So let's talk about what led to the enshitocene. What is it about this moment that led to the great enshitment? Was it the end of the zero interest rate policy? Was it a change in the leaders at those tech giants? Did Mercury go into retrograde? I think it's none of the above. First of all, the period of free money certainly led to tech companies having a lot of surplus to toss around, but Facebook started its enchitification journey long before the zero interest rate policy ended, and so did Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And while it's true that some of those big tech companies have had high-profile changes in leadership, Google's enchitification actually got worse when its founders came back to oversee its AI panic, which of course they call its AI pivot. And it cannot be Mercury in retrograde because I'm a Cancer. And as everybody knows, Cancers don't believe in astrology. When a whole bunch of independent entities all start to change in the same way at the same time, that is a sign that the environment that they operate in has changed. And that's what happens to tech. Tech companies, like every kind of company, have conflicting imperatives. On the one hand, they want to make money. On the other, making money involves hiring people and motivating them and also making products that people want to buy. And the more value a company permits its employees and customers to carve off, the less value it has to give to its shareholders. The equilibrium in which companies produce things that we like 
in an honorable way at a fair price is one in which charging more or worsening quality or harming workers costs more than the company would make by cheating. Now, there are four forces that discipline companies and prevent them from cheating. They serve as constraints on the incitificatory impulses of their executive teams. The first force is competition. Companies that fear that you are going to take your business elsewhere are cautious about worsening quality and raising prices. The second force is regulation. Companies that fear that a regulator will fine them more than they stand to make from cheating are less likely to cheat. Those two forces affect all industries, of course, but the other two forces are tech-specific, and they act on the tech companies in particular. So the third force is self-help. Computers are extremely flexible, and so are the digital products and services that we build out of them, because the only computer that we know how to make, the only computer that computer science can build for you, is the Turing Complete Universal von Neumann machine the computer that can run every program that we know how to write. Every valid program can run on every computer. And that means that a user can always hypothetically avail themselves of a program to undo the anti-features that a company has introduced in order to enshidify its products. Think here of a hypothetical. You're at a boardroom table, and someone says, hey, I've calculated that if we make our ads 20% more obnoxious, we can raise our revenue by 2%. In a digital world, someone else at that table might say, yes, but if we do that, 20% of our users are going to install an ad blocker. And then our expected revenue from those users, it doesn't stay static. It doesn't go up by 2%. It drops to zero forever. We never make another dime from those users. And that means that digital companies are always constrained by the fear that their enshidificatory impulses will trigger a counter impulse in the user to Google, how do I disenshidify this? Now, the fourth factor that weighs on tech is workers. Tech workers do have a very low union density, but that doesn't mean that tech workers don't have worker power. The historic talent shortage in the tech sector means that workers have historically enjoyed a lot of leverage over their employers. Workers who disagreed with their bosses could always quit and walk across the street and get a better job somewhere else. And they knew it and their bosses knew it. Now, ironically, this made tech workers more exploitable in certain ways. Tech workers overwhelmingly viewed themselves as founders in waiting, entrepreneurs temporarily drawing a salary, heroic figures of the tech mission, which is why that nonsense that we got from the big tech companies, Google saying, don't be evil, Facebook saying, make the world more open and connected, mattered, because they instilled a sense of mission in those workers. The librarian theorist, Fobazi Attar, she calls this vocational awe, but you might know it by the more vulgar term that Elon Musk uses, being extremely hardcore. <laughs> Tech workers had a lot of bargaining power, but they never flexed it when their bosses demanded that they sacrifice their health, their families, or their sleep to meet some arbitrary deadline. So long as the bosses were transforming their workplaces into whimsical campuses, with gyms and gourmet cafeterias and laundry services and massages and egg freezing, workers could tell themselves that they were being pampered rather than being made to work like government mules. For bosses, there is a downside to motivating your workers by appealing to their sense of mission, namely that they will feel a sense of mission. So when you ask them to enshidify the products that they ruined their health to ship, workers will experience a, a feeling of profound moral injury and re respond with outrage, refuse to do it, and threaten to quit. So the tech workers themselves were the final bulwark against enshidification. Now, the pre-enshidification era was not a time of better leadership. The leaders weren't better. They were more constrained. Their worst impulses were checked by competition, regulation, self-help, and worker power. So what happened? Well, one by one, every one of those constraints was eroded until it dissolved, leaving that enshidificatory impulse unchecked, ushering in the enshidicine. It starts with competition. From Gilded Age into the Reagan years, the purpose of competition law was to promote competition. US antitrust law treated corporate power as dangerous per se 
and sought to blunt it. European antitrust laws were modeled on those US laws as technocrats from the US came over during the Marshall Plan years and rewrote European competition law to be in line with American competition law. But starting in the neoliberal era, competition authorities all over the world adopted a doctrine that they called consumer welfare. Consumer welfare holds that monopolies are evidence of quality. If everyone's shopping at the same store and buying the same thing, that means that that's the best store selling the best thing, not that there's anyone cheating. And so all over the world, governments stopped enforcing their competition laws. They just ignored them as, their, as companies floated them. The companies merged with their major competitors. They absorbed small companies before they could grow to become big threats. An orgy of consolidation that produced the most inbred industries imaginable. Whole sectors grown so incestuous that they developed half their jaws. From eyeglasses to sea freight, from glass bottles to payment processing, from vitamin C to beer, most of our global economy is dominated by industries with, that are themselves dominated by four or five companies. If smaller companies refuse to sell to these cartels, the giants have free reign to flood competition law again with predatory pricing that keeps independent rivals from gaining footholds. When diapers.com, for example, refused to sell itself to Amazon, Amazon lit $100 million on fire, selling diapers well below cost until diapers.com collapsed, Amazon bought it for pennies on the dollar, and shut it down. Competition is a distant memory. As Tom Eastman says, the web has turned into five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. <laughs> So these giant companies, they no longer fear losing our business. They're not disciplined by competition. Lily Tomlin, the actor, used to do this great bet on a show called Laughing, where she would play a telephone operator for AT&T doing commercials for the Bell system. And every one of them would end the same way. We don't care. We don't have to. We're the phone company. Today's giants are not constrained by competition. They don't care. They don't have to. They're Google. So that's the first constraint gone. And as it slipped away, that second constraint, regulation, was also doomed. Because when an industry consists of hundreds of small companies, they are a mob. They're a rabble. Uh, they can't even agree on how to cater a meeting where they would all get together and decide on a single message to tell parliament or the commission or Congress. But when a sector dwindles, to four or five or three or two companies, it ceases to be a mob and it becomes a cartel. Five companies or four or three or two or one find it very easy to converge on a single message for their regulators. And without the wasteful competition eroding their profits, they have a lot of money to spend on mobilizing that message to the people who are supposed to be their watchdogs. Think of Facebook handing out millions every year to the former British, Prime Minister, uh, British Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg to sleaze around Europe, glad-handing his, his former colleagues, telling him that Facebook is the only thing protecting European cyberspace from the Chinese Communist Party. Text regulatory capture allows it to flout the rules that constrain the less concentrated sectors. Tech can pretend that violating labor, consumer, and privacy law is fine because they're doing it with an app. This is why competition matters. It's not just because competition makes companies work harder and share value with their customers and workers. It's because competition keeps companies from becoming too big to fail and too big to jail. There's plenty of things that we don't want to use competition to make better. Think about the race to invade your privacy. After Europe passed the GDPR, the landmark privacy law, there was this mass extinction event for European ad tech companies. Those companies disappeared en masse, and frankly, that's fine, because those companies were even more reckless and more invasive than the American big tech companies, because they had so much less to lose. We don't want competition to see which ad tech company can be best at invading your privacy. We don't want to produce increasing efficiencies in violating your human rights. But still, Google and Facebook, who pretend that they're called Alphabet and Meta, have been unscathed by European privacy law. And that's not because they don't violate the GDPR. They violate the GDPR. It's because they pretend that they're headquartered in Ireland. 
one of the European Union's most notorious crime havens. And Ireland competes with other European crime havens like Malta, Luxembourg, Cyprus, sometimes the Netherlands, to see which country can offer the most hospitable environment for corporate criminals. Because any company that can fly a flag of convenience to avoid paying tax can fly someone else's flag of convenience if their host country decides to start enforcing other laws. Which is how you get the situation we have now where the Irish Data Protection Commissioner uh, processes fewer than 20 major cases per year despite being headquarters to all the major tech companies in Europe where the German data commissioner is hearing more than 500 major cases every year. So Google and Facebook get to act as though they are immune to privacy law because they violate the law with an app. Just like Uber can violate labor law and claim that it doesn't count because they're doing it with an app. Uber's labor pricing algorithm uh, offers different drivers different amounts to drive the same route depending on how choosy they have been. Um, if you, uh, this is something Vina Dubal calls algorithmic wage discrimination. If you're more selective about which jobs you're willing to drive, Uber will pay you more to drive them. But if you become uh, uh, seduced by those higher payments and start to drive more, Uber will slowly dial down the amount that you're getting paid for every ride. Uber incrementally reduces the payment, toggling up and down as you grow more and less selective, playing you like a fish on the end of a line until inevitably you lose to the tireless pricing robot and end up stuck with low wages and all your side hustles that you were using to earn your living before when you were only driving through were sometimes gone. Think of Amazon. Amazon violates customer protection laws but says it doesn't matter because they do it with an app. Amazon makes $38 billion per year from an advertising business, but it's advertising in inverted commas because they don't sell ads with their advertising business. What they sell is placement in search results. Companies that spend the most money go to the top of the search results, even if they're offering worse products at higher prices. If you click the first link on an Amazon search result page, on average, you pay a 29% premium relative to the best product and price on Amazon. If you click one of the first four items, on average, you pay 25% premium. On average, to get the best deal on Amazon, you have to go 17 items down before you find uh, the best deal that's there. Now, if you were to walk into any high street merchant and they played this game with you, we would find them into oblivion. They'd be out of business. But Amazon captured its regulators, and so it can violate your rights and say, it doesn't matter. We did it with an app. This is where that third constraint, self-help, would really come in handy. You don't want your privacy violated. You don't have to wait for Google and Facebook to be disciplined. You could just install an ad blocker. More than half of all web users have installed ad blockers. But the web, it's an open platform developed in an age in which tech companies were numbered in the hundreds. They were a rabble, and they couldn't control their regulators. Today, the web is being uh, devoured by apps, and apps are ripe for enshittification. Because regulatory capture, after all, is not just the right to ignore regulation, it's also the ability to mobilize regulation to attack your competitors. Today's tech giants got big by exploiting self-help measures. They loved self-help measures when it was them doing it. When Facebook was telling MySpace users, hey, quit the platform owned by the evil Australian billionaire and come hang out on the privacy-respecting alternative here at Facebook, they didn't expect those users to show up at Facebook and just hang out rereading the great privacy policy while they waited for their friends to wise up and come over. Facebook gave those old MySpace users a bot. And you gave that bot your MySpace password and username. And several times a day, it went to MySpace, grabbed all the messages waiting for you, came back to Facebook, put them in your inbox. You replied to them and pushed them back out to MySpace. So you could uh, leave MySpace and still be friends with your MySpace friends. When Microsoft was killing Apple by choking off its market oxygen, refusing to ship a functional version of Microsoft Office for the Mac, so offices were throwing away their designers' Macintoshes and buying a PC, putting a big graphics card, and getting Windows versions of the Adobe products for them, Steve Jobs did not go to Bill Gates and beg him to make a better version of Office for the Mac. He just got his technologists to reverse engineer Microsoft Office, and they made the iWork suite which has these three apps, Pages, Numbers, and Keynote, that perfectly interoperate with all the applications in Microsoft Office, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. 
when Google entered the market. It sent a crawler to every web server on the internet, presenting itself as a web user. Hi, hello, web server. I'm just a web user. Do you have any web pages? Do you have any more web pages? How about some more web pages? Every pirate wants to be an admiral. When Facebook, Apple, and Google were doing this adversarial interoperability to the giants that had come before them, that was progress. If you try to do it to them, that's piracy. If you try to make an alternative client for Facebook, they'll say you violated US laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and European laws like Article 6 of the European Copyright Directive. If you try to make an Android program that will run iPhone apps and play back the media you bought from Apple and its app stores, they will bomb you until the rubble bounces. If you try to scrape all of Google the way Google scraped all the web, they will nuke you till you glow. Text regulatory capture is mind-boggling. Take the law I mentioned earlier, Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, signed into law by Bill Clinton in 1998, imported to Europe in 2001 as Article 6 of the European Copyright Directive. This law is a blanket prohibition on removing any kind of encryption that restricts access to a copyrighted work. Now, historically, that's meant things like ripping a DVD or jailbreaking a phone, and there are penalties of a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense in US law. Now, this law was bad when it was passed, but in the years since, it had been so broadened by tech giants that it can be used to literally throw creators in jail for helping people access their own works. Here's how that works. In 2008, in an anti-competitive acquisition, Amazon bought a company called Audible, which was then the leading audiobooks company in the world. Today, Audible is a monopoly with more than 90% market share of the world's audiobook market. Uh, Audible requires that every book sold on their platform be encrypted with Amazon's digital rights management so that it can only be played in apps that Amazon controls. So say I write a book, I write a lot of books, and then I read it into a microphone, and then I pay an engineer thousands of dollars to master it, and then I sell it to you on Android, on, on Audible rather. And then I decide that I'm not getting a very good deal from Amazon, and I'm going to start selling somewhere else. And I want to give you a tool so that you can move the book I sold you to another platform, another app. The uh, act of providing that tool is a jailable felony, punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine, excuse me, for a first offense. That's a stiffer penalty than you would pay if you were to go to a torrent site and just pirate that audiobook. But it's also a stiffer penalty than you would pay if you were to go into a truck stop and shoplift the audiobook on CD. It's probably a stiffer penalty than you would pay if you put a gun in the face of the guy who drove the truck that delivered the CDs and stole his truck. So think of our ad blockers again. Half of all web users are running ad blockers. Most of us use apps though, and there are zero app users who are running an ad blocker. Because to make an ad blocker for an app, the first thing you have to do is remove the encryption from it to decompile it. And that's a felony. Jay Freeman calls it felony contempt of business model. So when someone in a boardroom says, let's make our ads 20% more obnoxious and increase our revenue by 2%, no one says, well, if we do that, our users will try and block uh, the ads. Instead, they say, let's make it 100% more obnoxious and get a 10% lift. Because if you go to Google and type, how do I block ads in my app? You'll get the answer, you can't. This is why every company in the world wants you to stop using their website and start using their apps. Now, there's no reason that gig workers who are facing algorithmic wage discrimination couldn't uh, install a counter app that allowed them to coordinate among themselves to reject all drives that fall below a certain uh, wage threshold. No reason except for that felony contempt of business model. The threat that the toolsmiths who built that tool for them could go broke or land in prison or both for violating Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, trademark, copyright, patent, contract, trade secrecy, non-disclosure, and non-compete. The whole ball of wax that we call IP law. In this context, IP is just a euphemism for any law that I can mobilize to allow me to exert control beyond the four walls of my business and control how my competitors, my critics, and my customers comport themselves. An app is just a euphemism 
for any web page wrapped in enough of that IP that you can go to jail for installing an ad blocker on it. We don't care. We don't have to. We're the phone company. So what about that fourth constraint? What about workers? For decades, tech workers' high degrees of bargaining power and vocational awe put a ceiling on enshittification. Even after the tech sector shrank to a handful of giants, even after they captured their regulators so that they could violate our, law, our, rule, our rights with impunity, even after they created felony contempt of business model and extinguished self-help for tech users, they were still constrained by those workers' sense of vocational awe and the moral injury they felt in the face of enshittification. Now, you may remember that at one point, Tech workers dreamed of working for a big dumb company for two or three years before striking out on their own and founding a company that knocked over that old company and outcompeted it. But that dream shrank. And it became, go work for a big dumb tech company for three years, then do a pretend startup that gets aqua hired by the company you used to work for as the most inefficient, bizarre way to get a promotion and a bonus you can imagine. But that dream shrank even further. Go work for a big company. Get a job for life. They'll give you free kombucha. And every Wednesday, you get a massage. Then that dream shrunk even further. It's over now. All that's left is work for the tech company until they fire your ass. Like last year, when 12,000 Googlers were fired just months after the company did a stock buyback that would have paid their wages for the next 27 years. Workers are no longer a check on their bosses' work impulses. Uh, today, the response to, I refuse to make this product worse, is turn in your badge and don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. Okay, this is a little depressing. It's a lot depressing. But hear me out. We have identified the disease. We have traced its natural history. We've identified its underlying mechanism of action. So now it's time to work on a cure. There are four constraints that prevent enshittification. There's competition, regulation, self-help, and labor. To reverse enshittification and guard against its reemergence, we have to restore and strengthen each of those. On the front of competition, it's actually looking pretty good. In the EU, in the UK, the US, Canada, Australia, Japan, and China, they're all doing more on competition than they have in two generations. They're blocking mergers. They're unwinding existing mergers. They're taking action on predatory pricing and other sleazy tactics. Remember, in the US and Europe, at least, we have good competition law in the books. We just haven't been enforcing it. So all we need is a change in enforcement regimes, not any new law. Now, the enshittifiers are not taking this line down. The business press can't stop talking about how stupid and old-fashioned all this stuff is. They call people like me hipster antitrust. And they hate any regulator who does their job. Like Lena Kahn, the brilliant once-in-a-generation head of the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, who's done more on antitrust law in three years than all of her predecessors combined in the last 40. Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal has run 80 editorials smearing Lena Kahn, insisting that she is an ineffectual ideologue who can't get anything done. Sure, Rupert, that's why you wrote 80 editorials about her, because she can't get anything done. Even Canada is stepping up on competition. Canada home of the evil billionaire, from Ted Rogers, who owns all of our telecommunications, to Galen Weston, who owns all of our grocery stores, to the Irving family, who own the entire province of New Brunswick. Even Canada is doing something about this. Last autumn, Trudeau's government announced that finally, decades after every civilized land on Earth had finally done this, Canada was going to get an abuse of dominance standard in its competition law. I mean, wow. I guess, when Galen Weston engaged in a criminal conspiracy to fix the price of bread, the most lay mis ass conspiracy you could possibly do as an evil billionaire, it finally got someone's attention, eh? Competition has a long way to go, but all over the world, competition law is seeing a massive revitalization. Sure, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher put antitrust law in a coma in the 1980s, but it is awake, it's back, and it's pissed! So what about regulation? How will we get tech companies to stop doing that one weird trick of adding with an app to their crimes and escaping enforcement? Well, here in the EU, they're starting to figure it out. Last, this year, the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act go into effect. 
And they let people who get screwed by tech companies go straight to the federal European court, bypassing the toothless watchdogs in Europe's many corporate crime havens. And in America, there's some move to finally get a digital privacy law. You people probably have no idea how backwards American privacy law is. The last time the US Congress passed a broadly applicable privacy law was in 1988. The Video Privacy Protection Act makes it a crime for video store clerks to share your rental history with the press. <laughs> it was passed after a right-wing judge who was up for a Supreme Court seat had his rentals published in a DC newspaper. The rentals weren't even all that bad. They didn't embarrass him. It's true that Judge Robert Bork did not get confirmed to the Supreme Court, but that wasn't because of his videos. It was because of, he was a racist creep who couldn't shut up about it, and he was a Nixonite cr uh, criminal who had been Nixon's solicitor general and had done a bunch of bad stuff. But Congress got the idea that their video rental histories might end up in the newspaper, and they freaked out and passed the VPPA, and that was the last time America got a big national privacy law. 1988. It's been a minute. And the thing is, there are a lot of people who are angry about stuff that has some nexus with America's piss-poor privacy environment. If you're worried that Facebook may grab you into a QAnon, or that Insta made your kid anorexic, or that TikTok is brainwashing millennials into quoting Osama bin Laden, or if you're worried that the cops are rolling up the identities of everyone in a Black Lives Matter demonstration or the January 6 riots by getting that data from Google, or that red state attorneys general are following teenagers to out-of-state abortion clinics, or that black people are being discriminated against by online lending or hiring platforms, or that someone is making gruesome AI deepfake, deepfake pornography of you, then you want a privacy law. Having a federal privacy law with a private right of action, meaning that individuals would be empowered to sue even if a government enforcer wouldn't take up their case, will go a long way to rectifying all of those problems, which means that the coalition for that law is so large as to be unstoppable once it coheres. So what about self-help? When do we get back interoperability? Well, that's a lot further away, I'm afraid. But it's true that the DMA will force interoperability standards on some of the big tech companies. You're going to be able to leave Facebook Messenger and still send up messages with iMessage and back and forth if you'd like. You'll be able to quit Facebook and go to Mastodon and send messages to the people who you left behind on Facebook. But if what the tech companies and the government agree to is enough for you, if you want to reverse engineer one of those apps and make it do something better for you at the expense of the company that made it, Europe has nothing for you in the DMA or the DSA. This is an area ripe for improvement. And I think it may be, given the direction of travel, that the US might be the first ones to open that up, which would certainly be on brand, right? For the EU to say, we have come up with the conduct that the tech companies must agree to. And for America to say, We've just decided we're not going to let you use the courts to stop other companies from doing stuff to you that you don't like. My big hope here is that Stein's law will take hold. That's a law from finance that says anything that can't go on forever will eventually stop. Letting companies decide how their customers must use their products is simply too tempting an invitation to mischief. HP has an entire building full of engineers thinking of new ways to lock your printer to its official ink cartridges forcing you to spend $10,000 a gallon to print your boarding cards and shopping lists. It's offensive. And the only people who don't agree are the people running the monopolies in all the other industries, like the medtech monopolists who are locking their insulin pumps to their continuous glucose monitors in the hopes of turning people with diabetes into walking inkjet printers. Now, finally, there's labor. Here in Europe, there's a much higher union density than there is in the US which American tech barons keep learning the hard way. There is nothing more satisfying in the daily news than the latest salvo by the Nordic unions against the Tesla guy. I have to say, Musk is the most Edison-ass Tesla guy we could have asked for. But even in the USA, there is a massive surge in tech union organizing. Tech workers are realizing that they aren't founders in waiting. The days of free massages and facial piercings and getting to wear black t-shirts to work that say things that your boss doesn't understand they're coming to an end. In Seattle, Amazon's tech workers walked out with Amazon's warehouse workers because they're all workers. And the only reason those tech workers aren't monitored by AI that notifies their bosses if they visit the toilet during working hours is their rapidly dwindling bargaining power. 
the way things are going, Amazon programmers are also going to be peeing in a bottle next to their desk. You know, for a guy who builds a penis-shaped rocket, Jeff Bezos really hates our kidneys. We are seeing bold, global, muscular action on competition, regulation, and labor, with self-help bringing up the rear. It's not a moment too soon because the bad news is, and shittification is coming to every industry. If your product has a network computer in it, the people who made it can run the Darth Vader MBA playbook on it. They can change the rules from moment to moment, violate your rights and say, it doesn't matter, we did it with an app. From Mercedes renting you the accelerator pedal in your car by the month, to the Internet of Things dishwashers that lock you into proprietary dish soap, and shittification is metastasizing into every corner of our lives. Software is not something that eats the world. Software is something that enshittifies the world. But there's a bright line, to, a bright side to all of this, because if everyone is threatened by enshittification, then everyone has a stake in disenshittification. Just as with privacy law in the United States, the potential anti-enshittification coalition is massive, unstoppable. Now, the cynics among you might be skeptical that any of this is going to make a difference. After all, isn't enshittification just a dirty word for capitalism? It's not. Look, I'm not going to cape for capitalism here. I am no true believer in markets as the most efficient allocators of resources and arbiters of policy. If there was ever any doubt of this, capitalism's total failure to grapple with the urgent climate emergency surely erases it. But the capitalism of 20 years ago made a space for a wild and woolly internet, a space where people with disfavored views could find each other, offer mutual aid, and organize. And the capitalism of today has produced a global digital ghost wall, filled with bot shit, crap gadgets from companies with consonant heavy brand names, and cryptocurrency scams. The internet is not more important than the climate emergency. It's not more important than gender justice or racial justice or inequality or genocide. But the internet is the terrain on which we're gonna fight those fights. Without a free, fair, and open internet, uh, that fight is lost before it's joined. We can reverse the enshittification of the internet. We can halt the creeping enshittification of every digital device. We can build a better enshittification resistant digital nervous system, one that is fit to coordinate the mass movements that we will need to fight fascism and genocide and save our planet and our species. Martin Luther King once said, it may be true that the law can't make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me, and I think that's important. And it may be true that the law can't force corporate sociopaths in the boardroom to conceive of you as a human being entitled to dignity and fair treatment, and not just an ambulatory wallet, a source of gut bacteria for an immortal colony organism called a limited liability corporation. But it can make that executive fear you enough to treat you fairly and afford you dignity, even if he doesn't think you deserve it. I think that's important. Thank you. What an act to follow. <laughs> No, uh, thank you so much for having me as a longtime reader of Unlike the Ambassador of Corey's blog. Uh, it's such a pleasure to meet you and to listen to your thoughts. My role here today for the next 15 minutes is to situate Corey's talk in the current political context. So what does the, as Corey calls it, enshittification of everything? Why does it so profoundly matter in this political moment? So how should we characterize the current political moment? I don't say this lightly, but I think it's fair to say that we don't just live in complex times, but we also live in fairly dangerous times. Let me just ask, uh, mention two aspects here. I think the first one is the rise in populism and far-right politics. Just a few weeks ago, we learned that far-right groups in this country have a very concrete plan for the mass deportation of millions of citizens. 
we've seen a shocking rise in anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim racism, and the deplatforming of Palestinian voices. At the same time, global inequality is rising for the very first time in decades. Today, 252 men have more wealth combined than all 1 billion women and girls in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And I haven't even mentioned the climate crisis and the growing number of wars that we're all entangled in. So what does technology have to do with the current political moment? It would be overly simplistic and frankly wrong to identify technology as the root cause of this complex crisis of crises. Just that it, as it would be equally wrong to suggest that technology will save us, it will definitely not save us. At the same time, however, no analysis of the current political moment would be complete without mentioning technology. So let's look at growing populism and far-right extremism. Again, just to be crystal clear, the root cause here is not disinformation or technology. But a handful of private tech companies essentially run the infrastructure of our global public sphere. And as a result, our ability to participate therein, to learn about the news, to voice opinions, and to hold civilized debates is mediated by the decisions and investments that these companies make on safety, on countering hate, on protecting freedom of expression, and on countering disinformation. There's been some improvement, especially with the DSA in Europe, which still needs to be enforced. But globally, the challenge remains significant, especially when it comes to the non-English speaking world, where these platforms have basically not invested any money. 2024 is the year of elections with people voting in India, in the EU, and in the US, among many, many countries. So having worked on this issue since the Cambridge Analytica scandal in 2018, my very clear sense is that platforms are still blissfully unprepared. And we're very much at the mercy of the decisions or lack of decisions that they make. So we now talked about digital platforms, but I think we have to take this analysis of corporate power even further. Large and unaccountable tech companies run the infrastructure on which much of modern life depends. So not just the social media platforms that have become the digital public sphere, but also a duopoly of operating systems, cloud computing platforms, and other digital public infrastructure. So as a result, and I don't think many people realize this, big tech now operates at the very heart of the state, from policing to healthcare to the military and border technology. There simply is no modern warfare without the very implicit involvement of the largest tech companies. From the war in Ukraine, where drones have been ordered on AliExpress, to the war in Gaza, which is a high-tech war. In all these domains, journalists and rights organizations have documented a pattern of unaccountability, of deploying technology that simply isn't fit for purpose, or that's simply incompatible with human rights. Face recognition, I think, is here the prime example of biometric identification systems. So this collective societal dependency on a handful of companies is only set to get worse because nowhere is the power of big tech more evident than in the current field of AI. So at least in the context of the paradigm of building ever larger models, there simply is no AI without big tech. So from startups to research labs to the public sector, that seeks to deploy AI, everyone relies on the computing infrastructure of Microsoft, Amazon, and Google to train their systems. Meanwhile, these very same AI systems rely on manual and often low-wage and exploitative labor of workers in each and every one of our data, ideas, and collective knowledge. So I'm gonna stop here, but I think the point is quite clear. As our world is becoming more digital and as our world is becoming more automated, all of this is happening in an industry that's characterized by more and more market concentration and an unprecedented accumulation of wealth. So what can we do? I think the stakes could really not be higher. We have a very short window of time to ensure that the technological infrastructure of our future does not come with built-in rights abuses and a further concentration of power. Here are six ideas, sort of mostly directed at governments. I think the first one is we need to understand what the task is. 
Technology and digital transformation is nothing that simply happens to us. There's no law of nature that dictates how platforms evolve, how AI will continue to develop in the future. Our role, especially as democratic societies, is to ensure that digital transformation protects and promotes human rights, advances social justice, and serves the full participation, agency, and dignity of people. In order to do that, we need to articulate an ambitious, coherent vision for what we want the future of technology to look like. So that means not just reforming or rounding the edges of the current status quo, but to articulate real alternatives. So that's the first one. The second one also means good, effective regulation, but with a real focus on power. Tech companies have become too powerful and the market has become too concentrated to rely on self-regulation. I think that point has become clear. But this is especially true in the case of data markets, platforms, or AI, where we need to be incredibly careful that the rules that we're um, agreeing on challenge rather than entrench the power of dominant players. Or, as the narrative that we are stuck in a race with China often leads to, that we build EU alternatives that are as bad as the American counterparts. So that's the second point. Here's the third one. I think we need to frame tech policy and tech regulation in terms of justice. I think one of the key lessons that I have had working on these issues for over a decade is that risks and harms are really unequally distributed. You and me and I'm assuming many people in this room are not going to be the key targets of harm. It is always people in communities who are already marginalized or excluded. So where are the progressive political parties on these issues? Here's the fourth one, again, directed at governments. We need to practice what we preach. It is especially important for democracies to practice what we preach, especially when it comes to protecting human rights in policing and intelligence or in the context of migration. Here's the fifth one, invest in alternatives. So merely regulating big tech's power isn't enough. I think Europe especially, but it's not limited to Europe, needs to cultivate its own technology sector and support open, sovereign, and independent solutions that align with rights and that present a real alternative. And then finally, I think at least in Germany, my sense is that digital policy or tech policy is still treated as a niche issue. We need to treat this with the urgency and the priority that it deserves. Even though this is slowly changing, uh, tech has now entered geopolitics and international relations. The G7, the G20, the UN, they've all, for example, put AI on the agenda. We need more public interest voices and expertise in all of these domains. Thank you for your time, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion with Corey and Helen. Test. Sure. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome today. Um, my name is Helen Starr. Um, and you've heard uh, from our two amazing panelists, and I'd just like us to take a few seconds of um, silence, which I know I need. Uh, from these both uh, very insightful and deeply complicated discussions. So if we could just um, take a few seconds.
Right, I guess I'll begin with um, uh, an example of uh, my way of thinking and, and my practice, um, which aligns with a lot of what was said today. So I work in, I work with artists, I work with marginalised artists mainly, uh, and I commission and produce um, uh, artworks which use uh, AI technologies. Uh, so virtual reality, augmented reality, um, uh, technologies um, uh, such as interactive storytelling, so um, thinking about platforms uh, like Itch, I work with a lot of these guys who are quite amazing because they pull from foundational software like CSS and um, HTLM and uh, allow uh, someone like me who works with very little resources to actually produce content of the quality that's shown in major museum and museums and art galleries. One of the ways that I work is, uh, if I think of a topic, then I'll commission an artwork to, um, that allows us to think deeply about that particular topic. So thank you to Corey, because now I know what I'm going to have to do uh, <laughs> for the next, um, probably 2025, actually. But I'd like to just talk about one of my projects, which um, uh, was around uh, gender violence and um, was about a game called Red Dead Redemption, uh, in which a, a non-playable character who was called the suffragette uh, was targeted by a lot of YouTubers and this meme erupted uh, called um, Kill the Suffragette and a particular player um, racked up 18 million views in one day based on his content on YouTube, which was about the many ways you could kill this uh, simple AI within Red Dead Redemption. The public was enraged. Um, the YouTube pulled uh, his um, YouTube channel, and it all blew up into a discussion of around um, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of choice, uh, around the fact that this simple AI suffragette wasn't actually a living being, and it was ridiculous. Uh, that people were getting outraged and ended up on the BBC and eventually um, eventually YouTube returned the channel where you can still go today and see how many ways you can kill this AI within Red Dead Redemption. So the interesting thing for me here is that uh, when you play that game, you can't play it with the black characters in Red Dead Redemption. So you can't, um, you, can, you can lasso them, uh, you can put them on a horse, uh, the black avatars, but you can't kill them in the same way that you can kill the suffragette because a uh, really famous example of a character who was lassoed and taken to a group of Ku Klux Klan members who were having a gathering within the game and the black character was thrown uh, at the non-playable characters and the game breaks. So there were two games, there were two uh, strands operating at the same time. There was one where players were um, playing with the black characters to see the different ways they could make the game break, which the developers had put in. It's wrong to, you know, torture black avatars, uh, but also the way uh, that an older woman who was simply calling for equal rights um, uh, could be killed, that was okay. So uh, the, the project, and in, in the comments, uh, one of the comments that had the most likes was a comment that said, um, why can't we do this in IRL? So that became the name of the project within the project, 
with the artist Megan Broadmeadow, we made a virtual reality game with uh, um, the Liverpool Magistrates Court and a um, amazing lawyer at FACT in Liverpool, who's a lawyer in residence. And we decided, since no one could decide what was right or wrong, that we would take the uh, avatar to court. We borrowed the building, we green screened, and we were able to actually use the data from the game to recreate our virtual reality experience. Thank you, Rockstar, for um, uh, not being like Disney and allowing us to use your assets. And we made our own story, describe it, had an exhibition where we invited our visitors to vote. Do you think this is right or wrong? Um, really proud to say 70% uh, of our visitors voted it is wrong. And so on that note, I would like to begin the conversation around what, what would an actual map look like today if we want to actually corral the big internet company, corral the 100, what is it, 162 uh, people who own more than the rest of the world, what would a map of that actually look like? What would we have to do? So I, I um, in computer science, there, there's problems that are simple that you solve by mapping out the terrain and trying to enumerate all the possible ways of solving the problem and finding the best one. But in computer science, we often run up against these computational limits where it would take longer to enumerate all the features of a data set than there are seconds left in the universe. And when that happens, you don't uh, try to build a plan that gets you from A to Z in the most efficient way. Instead, you come up with heuristics, rules of thumb, for ascending a gradient towards the thing that you're trying to attain, for, for uh, inch by inch in a stepwise way, getting to something better. Sometimes this is called ant colony optimization. It's modeled on the idea that an ant has got forward-facing eyes. It can't look up to know which way to go to get uphill, but it has all these legs. And so it can pull all of its legs at any moment and say, which of these feet is on the highest ground and take a step in that direction. And now it's newly situated. And it can explore some new terrain that wasn't visible to it when it was further down the gradient. And so I don't think that we have a map. I don't think that there is a road map for getting from here to a better future. But I think there are rules of thumb for it. I think that, you know, if we think about these four forces that discipline firms, for example, competition, regulation, labor, and self-help, there will be moments in the crises that are on our horizon, because if there's one thing the failure of 40 years of policy has given us, it's an absolute abundance of crises. There will be moments in which we can say, this is the kind of crisis where instead of doing the same thing we did last time, but harder, hoping for a better outcome, we can do something different. The next time there's some ghastly moderation failure on Facebook, rather than saying, Mark Zuckerberg, you are bad at being the unelected social media czar of 4 billion people. You have to get better or we'll find a new unelected social media czar. We can say, why, should, why don't we just start abolishing the job of social media czar? Why don't we tell Mark Zuckerberg that he has to tear down that wall, that he has to allow people who leave Facebook to message the people that they left behind, so that rather than being subjected to Mark Zuckerberg's impossible task of building a three-ring binder that's so thick that it has all the policies for all the social interactions for people in 100 countries speaking a 1,000 languages, that you can retreat to a community where the norms are set by you without being constrained by the, the fear of losing the people who matter to you who aren't ready to leave Facebook, being able to message them, but you can go to your own place. It is deeply weird that the only people on the internet who get their own website where they get to make the rules are far-right trolls and creeps. And we say, oh, those people at Kiwi Farms at 8chan and 4chan, they're in the shadowy corners of the internet. I want a shadowy corner of the internet, right? I want a shadowy corner where a billionaire doesn't get to decide how I live my life. And so we have these opportunities coming up where we can, we can seize that opportunity and, and use it in this way. I really like what Federica said about building European alternatives that are publicly accountable and so on. But building a European alternative that no one uses is of no use. 
if you want people to use a European made in Europe social media network or uh, alternative office suite or alternative browser or alternative mobile operating system, you have to let them bring over the stuff that matters to them. But we have to make it interoperable. We have to reduce the switching costs because it's not enough for a new offering to be better than the thing that we're stuck with now. It has to be so much better that it's worth giving up all the things that the things that we're stuck with now are giving us. And so one way to reduce that uh, necessity is to just make it so you don't have to give stuff up to leave. Let people take their data. Let people continue their relational uh, uh, transactions. Um, uh, let people seize the means of computation and be in charge of their own shadowy partners. So it's clear that the solution is there have to be radical alternatives. And all this sort of regulation, that's what I meant with like rounding the edges, this is not going to get us there. I love the question of map, because what's really interesting whenever I work with politicians, what terrifies me is how little understanding there actually is of the reach of market power and market concentration. So a few years ago with colleagues, we did a study on tracking in mobile apps. Not even the companies building apps fully understood what kind of trackers and what kind of data their apps were sharing. I spent a lot of time explaining how ads work to regulators. Um, and without that understanding, it's incredibly difficult to regulate in a way that doesn't actually benefit the people who are already dominating. I mean, the answer to the problem of ad surveillance is really straightforward. We should ban surveillance advertising. Right? The reality is that when uh, the public is given the choice about whether they want to be spied on to get better ads, they say no. Right? Apple gave people a box that you could tick to opt out of personalization of your Facebook ads, Facebook surveillance. 96% of Apple users clicked that box. The other 4% were confused or working for Facebook. Right? <laughs> but the kicker is Apple, after they did that, rolled out their own secret surveillance program on the iPhone for the same users, for the same purpose. They have their own ad network. Anyone who tells you that people don't mind being spied on if they get better ads is lying. Any regime in which you had to affirmatively consent before you could be spied on for commercial purposes would die on the vine. So just eliminate surveillance ads. Nobody consents to surveillance ads. Replace them with context ads. Rather than saying, I have a person looking at a web page now, and I know he's an 18 to 34 year old man child with an Xbox who's recently been searching for information about gonorrhea, you say, I have an 18 to 34 year old, or I have a person in Kreuzberg looking at a web page about running shoes. Who wants to advertise to whoever this person is? Those ads underperform by about 5% relative to the surveillance ads, but the surveillance ad companies take 51 cents out of every advertising dollar because they always know more about publishers' users than the publishers do. But the publishers will always know more about their content than the, than the tech companies will. And so just ban surveillance advertising. It resolves all of these ecosystem problems. Just, just make it illegal. It should be illegal. So arguably under the GDPR, it is illegal. So what I'm hearing from you, Corey, is this important concept of we need to own our own data. And if we own our own data, we can then say how it's used, right? You, you, can't, um, you can't just take it and use it at, at will if we have full ownership of it. So I agree that people shouldn't be able to take our data, but I think own is the wrong verb here. Uh, you don't own your data in the same way that you don't own your kidneys because they're not, they're not, it's not property. Right? Data is relational. Right? If your mother abused you, uh, and the fact that she is your mother is something that you own in common, you know that fact and she knows that fact, and you want to talk about your mother's abuse of you, and she says, but I own that data. You can't share that data. Or if you um, don't want some data shared, but your idiotic family members do, like how many people here like me found out that their parents did 23andMe and discovered that their genomes are now sitting in this leaky database assembled by this grifter who claims that you're 22% Viking and 18% Neanderthal, <laughs> right? Um, that the, the data is relational. Property is the wrong framework for it, not because it's not valuable, but because it is valuable, 
like your kids are valuable, but they're not your property. You don't own your kids. You have an interest in them. They have an interest in themselves. The state has an interest in them. Their grandparents have an interest in them. Their friends have an interest in them. We have these complex webs of relations that we use to describe the most valuable things that we own. And we never use property talk to talk about how it's valuable or money talk. If, if I said, well, I took your kid, but I left the money for your kid on your doorstep, we wouldn't say that was a fair exchange, <laughs> right? Um, if you said, well, I, 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 I sold my kid, we wouldn't say, well, that's yours to sell, right? So the most important things in our world are not things that we own. And if we're going to have a, a regime for privacy, it shouldn't be a property regime. It should be a sui generis regime that reflects this interconnected uh, nature of, of privacy. And the thing is, if you have data rights, you actually have more power than if you owned your data. Because once you give up ownership, you no longer have any rights. But with data rights, I have the access to correct, incorrect information, receive a copy, um, withdraw my consent, etc. So it's much, much, much stronger than the property. Oh, so that's really interesting. So for example, and this would be interesting for Corey, I have a friend who um, is an amazing writer, sci-fi writer, but he's known for <laughs> his um, the, the, the pattern, uh, the, his voice that you hear. So his, he's quite comedic. He's fa fantastic of uh, describing quite serious uh, subjects in a humorous way. And he found on an AI website um, his, his published books, but more than that, volume two. <laughs> and what was upsetting about that, and for me this is one of the problems with AI, is that it's able to capture what we call qualia in philosophy, right? So it was able to match his, his tone, the rhythm of, you know, from volume one, it was able to not just kick out uh, another good story, that's kind of easy to do, but it was able to capture the rhythm and pattern and tone of how he told his story. And there were many other authors uh, on that website. And I think the publishing companies are taking it to court, but it, it just gives an example of um, well, how seriously we need to take uh, how we are represented in terms of data. Is that? Well, I, I mean, I think that the, the number of instances in which someone should be able to write a sequel to something that you wrote uh, without your permission is not zero, right? There are instances, well-known ones, I mean, for example, Book one of the Old Testament, Genesis, the Hebrews ripped off from the Babylonians. Um, we have been writing fanfic of each other's work for as long as legends and myths have existed. The courts have recognized this. The limitations and exceptions in copyright are as important as the rights, exclusive rights in copyright. It's a very important Supreme Court case in the United States about a book called The Wind Done Gone that retold Gone with the Wind from the perspective of the enslaved people. The Margaret Mitchell estate took uh, the author to court, and the Supreme Court upheld her right to publish this unauthorized sequel, uh, and basically said, um, if we allow people to decide who can write critical works about what they've done, then we'll have a very impoverished critical environment, right? If you get to choose who can criticize you and how, unless you've got a very thick skin, we're not going to get much critical work. Now, the funny and perverse outcome of this is that it means that if you want to make fun of an author or criticize them or rubbish their work, you have far more leeway to make use of it than if you want to celebrate them. And this is the foundational crisis of fanfic right now, which is that the fanfic that is most loving and most uh, intensely felt is the fanfic that is most legally jeopardized. Uh, I don't know exactly what we do about it, but I, I will say that the idea that it should never happen is just clearly wrong. It's ahistorical. It pays no attention to how literature works. There are contemporary examples coming up all the time. There's a very well-regarded underground uh, volume of C.S. Lewis's Narnia books 
written by another author, Francis Spufford, who has shared with professional colleagues who heralded as the greatest of the Narnia books, better than Lewis's work. It's never been published, and it won't be published until Lewis has been dead for 70 years, because it is a celebration of Lewis and not a criticism, and that means that it's uh, not fair dealing or fair use. I'd like to pick up on Fred Vicky's uh, point. You mentioned Cambridge Analytica. I have a story about that. When Cambridge Analytica was disbanded, the founders went off to Trinidad, which is where I'm from, and um, created a campaign uh, where they pitted the Afro-Trinidadians against the Indo-Trinidadians. And there was a Netflix, it's in the Netflix um, program on them where he talks about this and he laughs. And then he says, we're, just, we're, going to, we're going to go all over the world doing this. And to your point about te technology not being good or bad, we have to understand that it's who chooses to use it. Because I was thinking, you have no idea what a race war on a small island would look like. And also the people who paid Cambridge Analytica won the election. So that's a, a good example to your point about how, we, how do we police things, not just now, but in the future. I think there are three key lessons from the scandal. I think the first one is, I think what I mentioned earlier is platforms really, really aren't prepared. Formerly Twitter, now X, fired their human rights staff. They're severely understaffed as we're heading into this important year. I saw earlier this month that OpenAI is hiring someone for elections. I was like, that's a little late um, for 2024. So they're starting to think about it, but like it takes time to build up that expertise. And what I mentioned earlier with languages. So to this day, and it shocks me that it remains true, even the terms and conditions of platforms aren't available in all the languages that people speak that use the platforms. And I'm just speaking about Facebook. There are also there is Telegram, who doesn't even have policies on how they take down things, and or if at all, you can't reach anyone there. So it's like we're blissfully unprepared. So that's the first lesson, and that hasn't gone away. The second one is that many, many, many of the risks we're discussing in Europe and in, 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 in the US very often they happen in the majority world a few years earlier. And we should have listened. And I think that's the lesson from Cambridge Analytica. And then the third one is that we have to be really careful that all these companies sell a product and they're selling hype. So of course they oversold their capabilities. They're a large scam. It's very hard to truly rig elections. That doesn't mean it's not dangerous what they were doing, but essentially they were selling ads. They were, they were also doing blackmail and hacking and lots of other dodgy stuff. But we always have to be really careful to defend against the dangerous while also not running a free marketing campaign for these companies. Yeah, Lee Vinsel calls that crita hype, where you take on the, the most outlandish claims of your adversaries and rather than celebrating them for them, you condemn them for it. So you have a bunch of tech bros at Facebook who say, behold, I am a dopamine hacking wizard who could make you do anything with big data. Right? This is a claim that turned out to be wrong when Rasputin made it, when Mesmer made it, when MK Ultra made it, when those sick weirdos who call themselves pickup artists make it, when the deluded dupes who buy neuro-linguistic programming kits make it. Right, Everyone who ever claimed to have built mind control was lying to themselves or everyone else or both. And when we run around and go look at those evil dopamine hacking wizards, we help them sell stuff. Because the reason they're going around saying I'm a dopamine hacking wizard is because they're trying to justify spending a 40% premium for surveillance advertising to advertisers. And the one group of people that advertising production companies have been historically very good at selling things to are people who buy ads. Uh, Philip Wanamaker, the guy who started Wanamaker's department store, very famously once said, half of my advertising money is wasted. I just don't know which half which is an incredible testament to how good a sell job his ad people did on him because he, he thought only half of his advertising money was wasted. It was like 99% of his advertising money was wasted. This guy, this 
very smart businessman who built a department store empire was convinced that he was only wasting half of his money. So I think that it's that these companies are, are evil. I think that Cambridge Analytica's objectives were objectively bad. I think what they did was bad. I think that um, Facebook and the way that they've uh, handled our data uh, should permanently disqualify that leadership team from ever being involved in anything where they have other people in their power. But I think that you can believe all of those things without also believing that they finally cracked the Rasputin problem. Would, um, would either of you like to know or be interested in talking about loot, loot, loot boxes in gaming? which are known to specifically target people who have, a, you know, addiction. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's obviously true that there are some people who um, uh, struggle, who, like, if you think of there being a sort of normal distribution curve, like a bell curve of vulnerability to stimulus, so most stimulus regresses to the mean, right? You, 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 you've got a, a flat with a low, noisy refrigerator, and the refrigerator turns on for the first five minutes, you're like, oh, how am I ever going to get used to it? And then it disappears, and the next time you notice it is when it turns off. And for most of us, that's the case. But we all know the one person who can't get used to the refrigerator hot, right? And there are people like that for all stimulus, for gambling, for um, uh, certain kinds of misinformation, certain kinds of rage bait. I think we all know that person who, when you pick a fight with them, they can't back down. They don't calm down eventually. They just get angrier and angrier and angrier. So it's absolutely true. And if you are targeting people at scale, right, if you are hitting... 4 billion people, if you're the social medias are 4 billion people's lives, like Mark Zuckerberg, then you do have the power to reach an appreciable number of people, even if as a fraction of the overall users, it can be quite small. Some of you may be familiar with this infamous Facebook experiment where they took 60 million people and um, exposed them to a stimulus that they predicted would increase election turnout. It's a relatively benign thing to try and do. And about 200,000 people more than they anticipated actually went out and voted as a result of this. Now that is impressive, right? 200,000 people. It's also 0.4% effect size, right? A 0.4% effect size from the first time someone was exposed to a stimulus. And you would expect that on average, as people are exposed to a stimulus, it would become less effective, not more. The first time you saw 9.99, you didn't think 10 euros. Today, we all know 9.99 is 10 euros. Um, you eventually develop calluses over the soft spots. And so while it's true that non-consensually performing psychological experiments on 60 million people is an objectively bad thing to do, the idea that Mark Zuckerberg has figured out how to win elections is, I think, oversold. And it is a gift to Facebook and to the contractors who want to sell services to politicians to campaign on Facebook. The Markup, the U.S. media outlet, and NetsPolitik published a report last year on a data broker. Usually it's very hard to know how data brokers, what kind of segments they sell and how they target people. They found 650,000 segments online, and some of them were quite shocking. So there's one, people who are inexperienced credit card users, yeah. high alcohol consumption at home, uh, were two of these that I remember or just easily influenceable by ads. Mm -hmm. So the potential, even if the majority of us never click on ads, wouldn't be influenced by ads, the potential for harm and misuse is tremendous. Right. Um, that no, doesn't mean... It doesn't mean you should Yeah, but I'm, 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 I'm sort of talking about, obviously, my interest is that it's, it's always, there's a disproportionate, it's always the marginalized, right? So all these free games, as Corey said, you have, it's a numbers game. You have a billion people playing a free game of that billion. You know only 2% are going to use the loot boxes. They have the addictive personalities and they will go broke using these loot boxes. But that's what all you care about because 2% of a billion people is way more than enough money um, to let you run your entire scam, right? And that's where it, the problem becomes really complex because on the one hand, the majority of the people are getting great pleasure out of gaming. 
right? They're loving it. They're loving the storytelling. Everyone's happy. But it's the one or two percent who are getting uh, addicted. And, 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 and that's where, you know, sometimes democracy does fall apart. I just got my signal to say we can open for questions. So, person in the front, yes. just would like to, I have two questions basically. One, I was actually very curious all this time, and maybe you can address Corey for this. Why, in your opinion, in Europe, since the, I don't know, since the beginning of social media platforms, which is like how much, 20 years, uh, no platform was developed in Europe. Like why the European community feels so comfortable in a way to just be okay to use the American products, which is fine, I mean, but in certain like dignity or like you know, just feeling maybe pride for own products, because if you look around, um, you know, other, let's say, big, um, how is that? Um, um, you know, the big hubs in Asia, like in China, they have their own platforms. So this has happened. And the second thing, um, uh, I feel like it was not maybe discussed by you, but I'm sure you know. Do you know who is um, uh, William Colby? Do you know who he is? The CIA director who yes. oversaw the heroin campaign through Vietnam during the uh, Vietnam War. Exactly. That's a weird reference, but sure, go with it. <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, I knew you knew. <laughs> um, he was questioned by. Um, I think, I don't know, it was Congress, or it's like, mm -hmm. it was a, sure. quite was a famous sure. act that yeah. was still filmed. Little heroin here, a little heroin there, eventually things catch up to you. Uh, so, so yeah, and uh, uh, where he said uh, that as of his knowledge, all uh, media, and today we can say that social media is a media, mm -hmm. uh, all of them, to his knowledge, are uh, of any importance controlled by the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, um, I mean, I don't see any reasons why this would not be the truth today, but today, I don't know, it's not advice. So, instead of, a, instead of a, a saying that this is the uh, Mark Zuckerberg, yeah. I feel like, I mean, it would be more maybe honest to say that we don't know who Mark Zuckerberg is actually today. Uh, what is it behind this like, logo, uh, in a way. And um, also, um, I was a little bit disturbed how uh, this whole kind of uh, point of the conversation was directed to us as receivers of sort of like ads that we don't want to see and we want to block them, as if no one here is an entrepreneur like because if you do anything and you want to do it the right way not to be a great corporate i don't know you just want decent money you don't want to be a billionaire you just want to provide for kids independently so you set up a business that you want your local community to purchase from uh, before it will be killed by you know by the corporation and you need to promote i actually want my beautiful advertisement to be seen by you, because this is also part of the game. I mean, I see what you promote to me, your lifestyle, your news, your personal news, your choices, like as a tastemaker, as your ideas about the world. So it's a fair exchange in the communication with people I don't know, because today social media connect with them. And I want you to see my advertisement as well. I don't want you to block it, I'm sorry. Okay, I think we're ready to answer those. <laughs> So let me take the last question first. Uh, unless, did you want to start, Justin? I can take the government one. Okay. Uh, on the question of, of, of ads, um, the idea that uh, this, the additional 
um, fine-grained uh, tuning that you get out of surveilling everyone in the world. So we're not talking about banning ads, we're talking about banning <coughs> surveillance ads. We're talking about ads that are based on spying on everyone in the world to find the people who have the traits that you're seeking as an entrepreneur. The idea that that is a, a fair trade, I think, is wrong. I think that the small incremental drag on promoting services, look, I promote my books, I write novels, that is my living, right? People need to find out about my books. But we had advertising where people found out about books and firms and offerings and movies and all kinds of things through all of history. And it's only in the last 20 years that the way that we did that was by literally spying on every person in the world, everywhere they go, every conversation they have, everyone they know, every web page they visit, everything they buy, on the off chance that they're the person that is the right person to market your services to. And even if they are, right? So even if there's someone out there who's like, I am so glad I got the targeted ad for a Cory Doctorow book. There are 7 billion, 999 million, 999,999 people I spied on who didn't feel good about that in order for me to reach that one user. And it's not proportional. So I think that um, we, uh, we, we uh, can have ways of promoting our work, but that the surveillance mechanism is not a good one. And moreover, historically, the non-surveilling advertising industry had an intermediary sector, so the brokers who placed the ads and made the ads, that accounted for 15% of the sector. The surveillance advertising business, the intermediaries account for 51% of the sector. And so, yeah, you might be able to find three incremental extra customers by knowing when they went to the toilet. But the revenue you get from those users has to be offset against the massive sum of money being creamed off by monopolists who sit in the middle doing all this fine. And I think that there will be some small losses and some small gains when we eliminate surveillance advertising. I don't think it's the end of marketing services to people who want to find out about them. Uh, and, I, and I think that it's the right trade-off to make. <laughs> So the relationship between governments and companies is complicated. Uh, only in 2012, when the Snowden revelations happened, 2013, 13, we were exclusively talking about the power of governments, government surveillance. Cambridge Analytica now has shifted uh, direction again, and we're now almost exclusively talking about how problematic big companies are. But the truth is, uh, both can be problematic and their relationship is complicated. So one example is sometimes even evil billionaire tech companies can be really powerful allies against government surveillance because they have the power to push back against governments who have access to data. That doesn't justify their existence and they should still be broken up, but I'm just sort of like to explain what the dynamic is. What makes this current moment so dangerous is that or it's always dangerous when the interests of the two are aligned because then accountability is really, really, really hard. And that's why the current moment is so dangerous because with the current paradigm of AI, of building ever, ever larger models, very few actors can build them and they're all private companies. So governments are dependent on these companies if they believe the hype that this is the future of tech. So that's dangerous. So, just a reminder, it's complicated and the alliances keep shifting and we need to keep both in mind. Yeah, I think that's really well said. It's a public-private partnership from hell. I mean, the, the tech companies understand that if they build a chocolate box full of all the surveillance data governments can't collect for themselves, that governments won't pass laws telling them to stop collecting the data provided they turn it over on demand. And so this, the, you know, when I go to DC and I speak to government audiences, they're like, well, you know, I have classified clearance. I already had to tell the U.S. government everything compromising about me. I don't care. But those, you know, bastards at Google will sell their mother for a dollar. And then I go to Google and I say, well, all Google wants to do is show me better ads. But those dum-dums in Washington, D.C. are the people who are too stupid to get a job at a tech company. I don't want them spying on me. And the reality is that the only reason either one is allowed to spy is because the other one uses their data and vice versa. <coughs> So the first time I realized this was happening was a friend of mine was got a job at Google. Uh, she was Japanese, and it was about walks in Japan and mountains. 
and Google asked her to translate. So you would go on a walk for a mountain to sacred spots and the app would show you where the sacred spots were. And I was very interested and asked her, well, who paid your fee? Turned out it was a big insurance company who paid her fee because the insurance company was collecting data on how long it took someone to make the walk. And then they would know how to set their premiums because if someone took 20 minutes to do the walk, that's a fit and healthy person. If someone took 60 minutes, then that's a person who is going to have to pay more. And of course, the issue was nobody knew the marketing for the for the walk was oh come and you know explore the sacred sites da, 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 da. so I think this is this is the surveillance um, the advertising surveillance that for me is the most problematic and That's, it's not yeah it's not I think when we when we say that ads are problematic. People think it's about ads. Yes, ads are problematic, annoying, mostly inefficient and overhyped. But the entire ecosystem behind it is a massive trove of data that all kinds of entities tap into. Mm -hmm. Especially in the US, in the complete absence of any meaningful regulation. Insurance, except for videos. Except for video shows. <laughs> but you have insurance companies, but you also have law enforcement. You had the Immigration Enforcement Authority uh, tap into location data. Mm -hmm. Um, very recently, there are sort of also very conservative activist groups buying uh, advertising data to, to forcibly out gay Catholic priests or gay priests, anti-abortion activists targeting women seeking abortion with ads in clinics. So this is not about ads. This is an ecosystem that, if it's under-regulated, can be tapped into and exploited by anyone. Yeah. And on the subject of CIA owning all the press, I, I think that there's two things that we need to keep in mind about students. So the first is that they lie to us all the time. That is kind of good with the job. Look at the stone revelations. They, they are fountains of bullshit about what they're doing, how many attacks they've stopped, how many, you know, how effective they are, how many spies they've uttered. When you, when you hear the kind of spy versus spy Cold War stuff, it's just all these absolute weirdos kidding themselves and kidding everyone else about what they're doing. But the other thing that you have to remember is they lie to themselves, just like tech bros do. They are convinced, they're the, they're the people who are most convinced that spies are really good at their jobs are spies. And so Colby might have really, remember, convicted heroin trafficker William Colby might have really believed that his bosses controlled all the media in the world. He is not a reliable uh, witness on what his bosses can do because he is exactly the sort of person who might overweight this. I worked for Alan Rusberger at The Guardian during the, the Snowden revelations. I would be awfully surprised, to, to put it very mildly, if the CIA was running The Guardian while we were publishing the Snowden documents. That would have been a very weird flex for them. <laughs> we, we have, we, we, sorry, we, we have 10 more minutes. I'd like to take two questions. Um, uh, first off, thank you all. Um, it's uh, you're all brilliant, and it's a pleasure uh, to uh, to listen to you. And it's it was all very thought provoking. Um, there's just one thing that I would like your thought on that I don't completely agree with what you said because Curry, you mentioned that um, that when the Apple users could uh, choose if they want to be surveyed for, for targeted ads or not, they choose not. But I don't think that's uh, proof that they actually don't want to be surveyed. I think that if they would stop using Apple after they found out that they were actually being surveyed, that that would be a proof that they don't want to be surveyed. Because I think that most people really don't care. Um, uh, when I talk to people on, um, uh, like on uh, from different <laughs> social bubbles, a lot of them are, ah, are, it's like our data are everywhere. I don't care. Like Facebook has it all anyway. What should I care? Like, why do I care? You know, it's, um, it's just not there. So my question would be for, for all, of, uh, all of you or both of you, um, what do you think would need to happen 
for majority of people to really, really care. So th this is this idea out of ec economics revealed preferences, that what you do matters more than what you say. And so if you're still on Apple after they, you find that they're spying on you, then you don't care about being spied on. I think a more refined way of understanding that is if you're still on there when you find that they're spying on you, that you don't, that, that your anger at being spied on is less than the estimated cost to you of giving up everything and switching platforms, especially in a duopoly where there's nowhere else to go. Um, you know, the problem with voting with your wallet is that the voting with your wallet election is a one where the people with the thickest wallets have the most ballots and the monopoly party wins every time. And so I, I think that um, the fact that no one, that the argument is that people, if they knew they were being spied on and had a choice, they would say, no, don't spy on me. Uh, or, or they wouldn't say, no, don't spy on me, is wrong because we know we, we get in that choice and they chose it. So now we're left with this very kind of um, uh, paternalistic view where it's like, well, actually, you like being spied on. You just click that box because you're contrary and you don't know what's good for you. I, I, I mean, there are very few things in this world that 96% of us would click a box for. Uh, the fact that we all click that box to say, don't spy on me, I think is a pretty strong signal. Maybe your normie friends are nihilistic about this. Maybe that's because they're, they, they haven't been bitten in the ass by it yet and been denied uh, insurance coverage or uh, had their kids taken away by child protective services because there's something in the data that didn't make sense or been stopped at a border or been targeted by creeps for revenge porn because they had malware on their computer that was spying on them. You know, the, I, I think that uh, in the same way that they say a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged, I think a privacy advocate is often someone who has woken up one day to figure out just how harmful all this data collection can be. And to add a slightly different perspective on top of this is, so what if people don't care? I think people are busy, people have like economic hardship, there's like the news are terrible. It's like we don't get people rallying the streets for data privacy if we frame it that way. But something that I think this is from Max Schrems, who is suing Facebook since years and runs an amazing NGO that does that professionally, um, is he compares this to food security. So when I go to a restaurant, I also don't get my little test kit out to find out if this restaurant is safe or if I go to the supermarket, I don't do the same. I trust that there are systems and institutions and checks in place. That means I'm not going to get poisoned most of the time, like 99.9 .9 in, in a country like this. Why are our expectations on technology so different that it's more it's sort of more common than not common that you use an app for health, whatever, and you have absolutely no idea whether this is a safe option or not. So it's like this is like a very consumer protection kind of angle, and there's way more to this. I think it's also about justice in the sense that most of us most likely won't ever experience harm directly but we can still be enraged on behalf of those who will, those who are more vulnerable. But our expectations have become incredibly low. Uh, and we've almost resigned to the fact that there's a duopoly and we have almost no choice. Last question back there. Yeah. Hi, um, Franco here. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, I have a really simple question, which is right now there's this hype around red teaming of AI companies like uh, OpenAI and Mistral and saying they want to involve people and kind of identifying some of these gaps. What do you think about those initiatives? And a second question to that is, is there any viable in collaboration for co-regulation between these big platforms and people? Do you see some examples out there that inspire you? Or is it more on the civil society side question? Well, in terms of the second part of this question, are there uses for AI that I cheer on? Like, I think there are a lot of inconsequential uses for AI that, I'm, that I, you know, don't see anything wrong with. If I was a 14-year-old Dungeons and Dragons player, I would be getting the journey to spit out pictures of my cool elf all day long. There's no problem with that. I like the idea that a hospital can increase its expense by hiring an AI to sit next to its radiologist and give second opinions on solid masses on chest x-rays, I fear that the reason that the AI company raised investment capital is because they think that they can get hospitals to fire their radiologists and replace them with the software. And I absolutely do not want my chest x-ray measured by that. 
But I'll give you an example of a large language model doing something that I think is terrific. There's a nonprofit called the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, hrdag.org. They're statisticians who work on human rights tribunals, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity. They worked on Milosevic, Ruiz Monte, uh, um, East Timor, <coughs> and so on. And um, they work with the New Orleans Innocence Project, uh, which is an exoneration project for wrongly convicted prisoners. And uh, they use a large language model to uh, identify correlates of uh, uh, officers in the data involved in wrongful convictions to analyze a much larger data set to create a funnel of stuff that human beings then examine for exoneration work. And it was very effective. And it was something that, that requires more human errors than we've got. And this is not, it's not like we took good, hardworking human rights workers and replaced them with a bot and made them go off and, you know, uh, 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 beg for beg on the street, right? We took those same good, hardworking uh, human rights workers and we gave them a tool that can be more effective. I think that's super cool. And yet, the fact that companies, or like in addition, companies release tools that then need red teaming to be fixed is reckless. Um, these companies have unlimited resources to fix their models before they're being released. Um, and what I found interesting working in a human rights organization is that AI companies then ask for feedback, like, can you identify harm cases? And I was like, that's your job. You have limited resources to fix your models before they're being released on the public. Like, Although I will say that I prefer companies be deprived of the right to decide who can report bugs on their products. There is a widespread and increasing problem where companies punish researchers who identify dangers in their products and say, no, 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 we have a special bug bounty. You come over here, you tell us in secret, we decide when the public knows about it. So at CCC this year, we have the Polish hackers who discovered that the trains in Poland had been infected with malicious software by the manufacturer that attempted to determine whether you had someone other than the manufacturer service the train, and if they had it, bricked the train. And the company threatened to sue the researchers for telling the Polish public who paid for these goddamn trains that the manufacturers had sabotaged them. So I would read to, you're right, that companies should be making their products fit for service, but I also think that red teaming of products at post-release is really important. We need robust protections for security researchers who disclose vulnerabilities in products that we are trusting so that we know whether or not we can trust them. Right. Well, <laughs> I say cheers to that. Um, we, we have to wrap up now, but I always like to leave panels with hope. Um, and... Uh, I can tell you about um, one of my dear friends who left Google screaming, one of these super smart kids that Google took at 13. Um, and she has made it her mission. She's now an extraordinary AI engineer. And she decided to put her mind to working on an algorithm which tells you exactly how much metal is needed for the same amount of tensile strength because this solves multiple problems. You can now make, with this sort of AI, you can engineer airplanes, which are as strong as the ones we currently use, but maybe weigh 30% less. These are the sorts of problems where um, ethical AI programmers are working on and are working towards the bigger goal, which is not money, but making a better world for us all. So it's been uh, a wild ride learning about um, Corey's work and it's being expanded on with Frederike. I'd like to give both, both guests a massive round of applause. <laughs> mentioned that Corey has a brand new book coming out. <laughs> I, I wrote nine books during lockdown, so you can say that at any month between 2022 and 2026, and it would be true. But the next book is called The Basil. It comes out on February the 4th, and they have some copies at other land in Kreuzberg, so if you want to get it, they've already got it. There you go.
Um, and finally, to I would like to personally thank the amazing Nora. <laughs> and her wonderful team for putting together such an amazing uh, and deeply thoughtful festival, having the courage to have us talk about things that we often don't want to think, hear and talk about. And... <laughs> yes, I've never heard the word shit so many times in one life. <laughs> Thank you everyone.